the King of Glory. Coming on the clouds with fire, the whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy washing over. The people sing. The people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. Oh, I see a new revival. Oh, it is stirring as we pray and see. Of witnesses, 
Let us run, let us run with perseverance. The race marked out. Let us make a way for those who are to come. Those who are to come. Every generation, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. They will sing. They. Holy. 
Welcome this morning to New Hope Church online. <laughs> Whether you're watching in the comfort from the comfort of your lounge room, you may be in your kitchen, your dining room or even sitting on your bed, we welcome you today. Well, what a week it's been. New Hope uh, called a week of uh, fasting and prayer and today marks the end of that week. We've had some reports of things that the Lord has done in our lives, words given by the Holy Spirit and some personal revelations and just joy at overcoming things as we fasted. How did you go? We'd love to hear about it. We'd love to hear from you. So feel free to text us. Remember Colin's number 0414. Oh, no, that's mine. 0414684865, that's mine. Rolls off the tongue, but Collins is 0415 You can text uh, anything to him, prayer requests and stuff. We tell you that each week and we're more than happy to hear from you. Or you can email. Why don't you write a little blurb about your uh, experiences this week and if you have something to share from the Holy Spirit, something that you woke up with and the Lord shared with you or in your time where you replaced your time of eating or whatever you were fasting uh, with time with the Lord and often time he will drop something into your spirit. So we'd love to hear about that and you can email us on admin at newhopechurch.com.au. That's admin newhope at newhopechurch.com.au. We'd love to hear those. Not only about victories, but maybe challenges you faced, revelations you received, and all that the Lord's done in your life. You may have truly fasted for the first time in your life. So how did that go? We, of course, understand that not all can fast food um, because of medical situations and, and medications and things such as that. But how did you go? We'd really love to hear about that. So I find that fasting brings you into a deeper and closer relationship with the Lord. It often gives us, you know, a deeper understanding of ourselves, who we are, and it often serves as a personal revelation uh, of people, how they can, with the Lord's help, overcome some things. So let us know how you went. So I'd like to invite you now to prepare your uh, elements for communion as we come into communion today. And we come in with the understanding that communion's a time to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. The bread and the wine are tangible, physical reminders of Christ's love for us. Every time we eat and drink, it's a reminder of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Just as we depend on food and drink to survive physically, we can only live spiritually through Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice on the cross. Amen. At the same time, communion is also a time to examine ourselves and our walk with the Lord. As instructed in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29, it's also a time to, for a heart check. As we, uh, are we walking out our faith and living in an active relationship with Jesus, allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and to sanctify us? Or are we living life according to our choices and only partaking in communi communion as, as maybe a rule or, or, or a, a ritual. It's all about communion and fellowship with God, isn't it? The dictionary describes communion as a close relationship with someone in which feelings and thoughts are exchanged. It's an intimate communication. Communion is a relationship that is close and special. Psalm 1611 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's a time to feel the closeness of your relationship with God. As we examine ourselves, some of you may feel unworthy to come to him, and this happens to me regularly just about every week when I come to communion, thinking that maybe you're not good enough, that you're constantly failing in your walk with God and that you've blown it yet again. Well, you know what? I want to encourage you today. This is the very reason that Christ died, and that is why he came for you. This is the irony of the gospel. A quote from Tim Keller sums it up really well. The irony of the gospel is that the only way to be worthy of it is to admit that you're completely unworthy of it. Amen. I encourage you today to enter into the mercy of God and allow him to work in your life as you love and adore him. His Holy Spirit will transform you into his likeness day by day. Praise God. Everything that you do must flow from your heart's desire for God and because of your love for him. 
everything else just would become a religious activity, wouldn't it? When you realise your unworthiness and the extent of God's sacrifice for you to rescue you and give you hope and a future, as the word tells us, how can you not fall entirely in love with Jesus? Amen? Love him and run to him in your weakness, knowing that your debt that you couldn't pay has been paid for you on the cross by Jesus. Have communion with God and use this time of partaking in communion to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's love for you, and to examine your love for God. Amen. Let's eat and pray together, thanking the Lord in your own words for all that he has done. Let's eat and drink together. We take the emblem of his body that was broken, scourged, whipped, lashed, devastated, but he so willingly went to the cross for us. So let's take that together in Jesus' name. And this cup which represents the shed blood of Christ for the remission of our sins. He went to the cross that we may be made worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. As we're in an attitude of prayer to the Lord, let's pray for those around us, those we know uh, who are unwell at the moment, who are, are struggling. There are so many today. We hear it all the time people struggling with mental health, people struggling with illness, this whole COVID situation, people are really struggling. So can we pray today particularly for those that are locked down? Well, basically we all are, but those that are locked down and alone. I have a real heart for those that are on their own, that are locked down, have no one else. So can we pray today? Father, we just bring those people to you today. Not only the sick, but yes, the sick. Yes, the infirm. Yes, the ones who are unwell. We bring them to you today, my God. And we ask your Holy Spirit that you would touch them by your Holy Spirit, that you would meet them at their point of need. And I particularly think in this time of this COVID lockdown and all the things that that encompasses, Lord, I think of those that are alone. I think of those and I pray, Lord God, that you would be their friend, that they would rely on you, that they would look to you in their heart of hearts, that they would come close and use this as a way and means to come closer and closer to you and, and, and encourage their relationship with you and grow their relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would touch their hearts. I pray that you would comfort each and every one of them, my God, and bless them. Indeed, Lord, in Jesus' precious name, we pray for those, as I said, who are unwell. We pray for those who uh, uh, have sickness. We pray for those in hospital. We pray for those in need today, whether it be emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever their need is, Father God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would go and touch in Jesus' precious name and make well, Lord, and we give you all the praise and glory because it belongs to you, for you are faithful, Lord, when we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I think I just really pray that you're all well. You're all doing well. Let's have a look at some announcements now. Welcome to New Hope Church today, as I've already said, and I pray that you are sitting in your lounge rooms and enjoying. Maybe uh, some of you are breaking your fast this morning, as we are. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's going to be a great time. <laughs> so fasting breaks the change. New Hope Church is coming to the end of our prayer and fasting week, and that's today. On the 15th of August, I pray that you, it was just a magnificent time for you. And I pray that it's if it was a time when you've never fasted before, that it became a time when you, uh, when you found out some new things about not only the Lord, but about your strength and who you are in God and your relationship with the Lord. We, there's also already uh, a great book from Derek Prince, one of Derek Prince's most uh, most favoured books, most demand, most books in demand, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. It's an excellent little book. It's only a small book would take you no 
uh, not very long to read. So I'd encourage you to do that and I'd encourage you once again to just write a little blurb to us, write a little essay maybe, write a few words to us and let us know. Admin, send it in by email if you wish, admin at newhopechurch.com.au and we will collate some of those and it would be great, wouldn't it, to be able to share some of not only the, the um, experience you've, you, experiences you've had along the way but what about the revelations that the Lord has given you, the words that the Lord has given you, the visions perhaps, all of those things. Those things, if we were in a church uh, situation, if we were meeting at church, we'd have you out the front at the pulpit and discussing and and giving testimony. So we want to hear those testimonies. So if you could bring them in, uh, send them in to admin at newhopechurch.com. .au, that would be awesome. Or alternately, just text Colin with the scripture or whatever, a little short blurb uh, with 0415-491-914. Prayer and intercession group, whilst we're not physically at church, that's still happening. So I pray. I, I, I would ask you to send in your prayer requests once again with Colin's uh, phone number. Every t- Tuesday they're going to do that 10 to 11 a.m. Robin and Judy and Kathy and all of those guys that are still praying and interceding for you and for our church and all the needs. So get them in and we can uh, distribute those to Judy and Robin and they can, uh, they can head that up as they head that up. That would be great. Next is Men's Bible Study, Maximised Manhood with Ed Cole. And that's going great guns. It's an awesome time for the men uh, to talk about guy things, which is really good. I mean, guys don't get to do that much, do they? So it's a really good opportunity for guys to come together, talk about blokey things, talk about man things. It's really good. So that's every Tuesday, 4.30 to 5.30 via Zoom. And see, um, it says see Pastor Cole for more information there, but if you could just text him if you need a link or how to get onto that, um, all good. So just text Cole about that. Bible study also with Pastor Graham and Glenda, Wednesdays, 9.30 on Zoom. And they're still studying the Derek Prince book, By Grace Alone. I think they've dug a lot of great stuff out of there. So they're continuing with that. And you are most welcome to join that. Uh, if you need any more information about that, please contact us and we'll be careful to, we'll be sure to give you the um, information about that or contact Pastor Graham if you have his number and he'll give you the uh, link for that as well. Cuppa and a catch up. This has been fun. We have a, a catch up on Wednesdays from 7.15 to 7.45. We want to be really conscious and, and concerned about your time and taking too much of your time. But it was just like last Wednesday was just a fabulous little catch up. And um, we weren't too much over our 45 minute time, I think. But uh, grab a cuppa, be ready at 7.15 to join us on that Zoom link. Uh, it's the same Zoom link that we use all the time. Uh, so join us 7.15 to 7.45 for cuppa and a catch-up on Wednesdays. Women's Bible Study, we've moved this to online because it's just become, with the lockdown, it's become too difficult for people to, you're not allowed to visit people's homes. So we don't even have the five-person limit anymore. Uh, You're just not allowed to, they're telling us to stay home. That's all there is to it. So Pastor Sue uh, would like for us to join her 10.30 till 11.30 a.m. for the Women's Bible Study. And you know what? After that, because girls need fellowship, we know we do, we need a chat and a catch up with the girls. So if you'd like to, you can stay on, grab a sandwich, grab a salad, whatever you're going to do, and share over lunch, if you will. Pastor Sue will stay online for as long as you need her. Uh, We'll just keep that open. And the Zoom catch-up link there is on the uh, slide, and it's the same as the catch-up link. Okay, it's the Zoom link. uh, It's the same as the catch-up one that you always use, and we'll try and keep that consistent so it's easy for you to just click on that, and you'll be let straight in. No passwords, no anything straight in there on that Zoom catch-up link. And that'll be fun time. Holy Spirit Night's coming the 5th of September is our next Holy Spirit Night. But you know what? If we're not at church physically, we'll do something online, okay? It was great fun last time, and I'm sure it'll be just as fun, if not even better, uh, when, now that we're getting better at doing all of this stuff online. Uh, let's get together and make that a really, really 
great time. Sunday the 5th of September, if we're not back physically at New Hope in Strathmore Road, we will be online, okay? Thanks for being faithful in your giving. Um, we Unfortunately, we're not even in the building. We haven't been there for weeks and weeks, but you know what? We still have to pay the rent <laughs> and we still have to pay all our bills. So we just really want to thank you for being faithful in your giving. Um, if you wish to, you can go to newhopechurch.com.au and follow the prompts there to the you know, press on the giving button and follow the prompts. But I know a lot of our, uh, that's for anyone listening that's not already doing the direct debit into our account and stuff like that. And I think a majority of our um, regular people do that. So, you know what, we just want to thank you and bless you for that. <laughs> the Lord loves a cheerful giver and I believe New Hope is full of very cheerful givers. And I pray and believe that you see the blessing that comes from that. So thanks for that. Join us on Facebook. All of these things we, we try and put up on our Facebook um, so, you know, you can, you can find all of this information on there, hopefully. You know what? We've got something really great for you coming up now. We've got Daniel Second bringing the word for you. So I, for one, and a couple of others that know that Daniel's coming up have, have spoken to me and said they're really looking forward to his word today, and so am I. So are you ready? You got your cup ready? You got your pens and your Bibles and your notebooks ready? Let's just dive into the word today. And I just want to bless you, Colin, and I want to bless you, bless you, bless you. We love you. We miss you. We miss your gorgeous faces. But let's just come around the word today and invite Daniel right now. In Jesus' name, bless you. Hey, everyone. It's, uh, I hope you're doing well. It's an absolute honor to bring you the word this morning. So I'm going to be teaching... Uh, in the series on giving and my message this morning is on giving your way to your miracle that's giving your way to your miracle so i want you to open your bibles to 1 kings chapter 17 and verse 7 to 16. that's 1 kings chapter 17 and from verse 7. <clears throat> Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me also a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have it, any bread. And only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and then bring it to me. And then make some for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. And there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. You know, I think it's interesting that when you examine the different miracles that happen throughout the Bible and the various patterns that emerge that bring about these miracles, one in particular pattern I've discovered that is consistent with miracles happening is giving. Giving. It's like giving is one of the secret ingredients that causes your breakthrough to come to pass. Elijah asked this poor woman who was about to die of starvation to bake him a cake. <laughs> Can you imagine the audacity? If this woman didn't respond out of faith, she could have gotten extremely offended and ended up perishing. But instead, 
she responded out of faith and gave what she had left in her and in her obedience as as a result she received her miracle so why does god do this why in the most difficult of circumstances that does god ask us to give the very thing that we have our hearts set on to survive you know and and it it's it's a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge when god does this so let's look at these three points so first of all why does god require us require giving for us to break through why does god require giving for us to break through so i believe god uses giving in order for, for us to receive our miracle because he tests our faith open your bibles to genesis chapter 22 and let's read from verse 1. sometime later god tested abraham he said to him abraham here i am here i am i repl- he replied and then god said take your son your only son isaac whom you love and go to the region of moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains i will tell you about early the next morning abraham got up and saddled the, his donkey he took with him two of his servants and his son isaac when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering he set out for the place god had told him about on the third day abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance he said to his servants stay here with the donkey while i and the boy go over there we will worship and then we will come back to you abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife and as the two of them went on together isaac spoke up and said to his father father yes my son abraham replied the fire and the wood are here isaac said but where is the lamb for the burnt offering and abraham answered god himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering my son and the two of them went on together and when they had reached the place that god told him about abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it he bound his son isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood and then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son but the angel of the lord called out to him from heaven abraham abraham here i am he replied do not lay a hand on the boy he said do not do anything to him for now i know that you fear god because you have not withheld from me your son your only son the amazing principle that we discover here is that god will always test our hearts to see whether we are willing to give him the things that mean the most to us But the feel-good part of that story is the fact that God did not intend Abraham to go through with sacrificing his son, much to everyone's relief, especially Isaac. It was a test. The interesting thing is, is that 3,000 years later in the New Testament, we see Jesus doing a similar thing with a rich young ruler that he meets in Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 23. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come and follow me when he heard this he came very sad because he was a man of great wealth you know this is a powerful and confronting story because this man was doing everything right he was living his life according to the scriptures he lived his life in high moral rectitude and crossed all the T's and dotted the I's with all the law requirements, yet Jesus looked into his heart and saw that he could never be the Lord of his life because something else was the Lord of his life, which is the very thing that matters, that really matters. So as God tested Abraham with his son, the thing most precious to him, 
So Jesus tested this rich young ruler with his wealth, which was the most precious thing to him. You know, I honestly believe, well, I'm in two minds about this, but I honestly believe that if the young man trusted Jesus and was obedient and said that he would go and sell all his possessions and actually meant it, I honestly believe that Jesus wouldn't have intended for him to actually go and sell all his possessions. But then again, maybe not. Maybe he would have become part of the Jesus' followers. As it was with Abraham, I believe that this was a test also. Jesus said what he said so that he could see what was in his heart. Now let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in this desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. But why money? I mean, of all the things, why is it money that God tests us with the most? I mean, I've heard it said that the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the nerve from the hand to the hip pocket. <laughs> and I'm reminded of the movie trilogy of the Lord of the Rings <clears throat> and the meaning and the symbolism behind the ring. I believe that the ring is a allegory or a symbol of wealth and power and that the most people who come near it, it corrupts them and brings out the worst in them. But not so with Frodo. You see, people are attracted to money because money can buy people a roof over their heads. It can buy clothes on their backs, food in their pantries, and most importantly, security. Also, people get their reputations and find their identity in the money they earn. Do you know someone who's like that? You know, it's interesting that of all those things, the very things that God wants us to trust in him for. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we've shared about why God requires us to give before we see breakthrough. And that by giving it releases the stranglehold of our trust in money and declares our trust, faith, and dependence in God. So let's move on to point two, understanding God's economy. So in the world today, we have many different economies. We have the U.S. economy, the German economy, the Japanese economy, Australian economy. You know, we have the, the local economy and the global economy. And these, but these are all false economy, you know, and there are also, I should say, false economies, and there is a black economy, or the, what you call the black market. The Cambridge Dictionary definition of the word economy is the following. The system of trade and industry by which the wealth of the country of a country is made and used. The world judges economic success with material possessions. And that's why we live in an extremely materialistic world where there's a constant pressure to be driving the latest model car, to be wearing the latest designer label clothing and to live in the most exclusive postcodes. But Paul says in 2, chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, he says that in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful and proud, among other things. I remember the time when I was, well, I should clarify, this is actually a joke, <laughs> but I like to put myself in the joke. I remember the time when I was driving behind this guy, driving a brand new Lamborghini, and the guy ends up having a huge accident and rolls his car. In the process of, ro of rolling his car, one of his arms is torn off. I race over to the scene of the accident and notice that the man is sobbing and crying uncontrollably. I said, mate, it's okay. It's, you know, I ask him if he's okay, and he says that he is distraught because his new Lamborghini is a total write off. But I said to him, well, shouldn't you be more concerned over losing your arm, over losing your car, 
into that. He looked at his shoulder and says, oh, no, my Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> you know, we live in a world, and especially I believe in this Western culture, that we have a possession obsession. Let me say that again. In our Western society, we have a possession obsession. 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 to 17 says, For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. You know that God has an economy. The interesting thing about God's economy is that it's completely opposite to the economy of the world. The world's economy says, get, get, get. And God's economy says, give, give, give. The world says, get and you'll get more. But Jesus says, give and it shall be given unto you. Completely different. Two total opposite philosophies. And the world just doesn't get it when it comes to the godly principles of giving. And it's no wonder that the world gets skeptical when the church teaches these principles of giving because it's completely backward to them. The world thinks that the church is riffing people off by teaching these principles. But in reality, the people only get blessed. And the more they are blessed, the more that they are able to give. But it's important to understand that the boundaries of Scripture in relation to this, because as you probably already know, in regard to the, this topic has been exploited and which has brought about the whole prosperity go gospel, the prosperity doctrine, where in its extreme form has caused people to use Scripture to justify them chasing after financial gain to live the high life. The name it and claim it. The blab it and grab it, people. They believe that if you're not financially well off, then there must be something spiritually wrong with you, right? There must be some sort of sin in your life. That those who drive, you know, the flashiest car or live in the most biggest house, biggest luxurious house with views of the ocean, are the ones who are living under the favor of God, and that those who aren't, simply aren't where they should be in God. And we know that that thinking is wrong, but to bring everything into balance, the Bible also has this to say about financial blessing. In 3 John chapter 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And in Psalm 35 verse 27, it says, Let them shout for joy and be glad, who favor my righteous cause, and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, God says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give a hope in the future. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 says that the blessing of the Lord brings wealth and he adds no trouble to it. So the Bible clearly teaches here that God loves it when he sees his children prosper, prospering. And that his blessing actually does include financial wealth. Not all the time, but in, in more often than not, it includes also includes financial wealth. And when you really think about it, if being financially blessed was a bad thing, then the devil would make sure that you were covered in it. He would be in your boss's ear about giving you a pay rise. He will be sending new clients and customers to spend lots of money on your business. He'd be working hard that your shares and property investments go through the roof. But is that the case? No. So why is it so difficult for Christians to be in a position of financial strength? If the Bible says that it's good for us to be financially blessed, then why are the majority of Christians always financially struggling and living from day to day? 
Well, I believe it's because we don't understand the way that God's economy works. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 16 says, Of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? Wow, let me say that again. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? You see, God will never put money in your hand if you have no desire for wisdom to know how to use that money in God's economy. If God knew that if he gave you a large sum of money and your intent was to go and splurge on yourself uh, and disregarding others, then God will never give it to you. God will never give it to you. But if you sought God for wisdom, and understood the principles of God's economy, then God will continue to bring money your way. As the saying goes, if you can keep money out of your heart, God will always ensure that it's in your back pocket. Amen. So how does God's economy work? Well, in a nutshell, God's economy works very similar to the agricultural principles of seed time and harvest. Turn to Psalm 126 verses 5 to 6. It says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. You know, you might have read that scripture before and not realized that there is a powerful agricultural principle that gives us an amazing insight into the way that God's economy works. So let's unpack this further. So we see a farmer sowing seed and he's weeping while he's doing it. Why? Why is he weeping? He's weeping because he knows that he could feed his family with the seed that he's sowing. And it's the thought of his children going without and the seed that he could feed them immediately with that he's actually sticking in the ground. But he knows that one day, well, by faith, he knows that one day he'll return back from those same fields, singing songs of joy, carrying sheaves of wheat and barley with him. And you know, the problem with most Christians is that they eat their seed. They see their present needs and the demands of their family. And instead of sowing their seed in tithes and offerings, instead they eat their seed. And they wonder why they're always struggling living from day to day. God wants you to understand the principles of sowing and reaping, of seed time and harvest. He wants you to stop eating your seed and he wants you to plant it so that you can have a harvest. As Christians, it is our responsibility to understand God's economy. Right, so let's now go to my third point, our responsibility to prosper. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 122 and verse 9. Psalm 122 and verse 9. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Did you catch that? Whose sake is it? Is it for the sake of the house of the Lord our God? And whose prosperity are you seeking? Is it your prosperity or God's prosperity? It's God's. We seek God's prosperity. It, as it, it doesn't belong to us. And we are stewards of his prosperity. And why does God want us to be stewards? For the sake of his house. King David says in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 5. Now David said, Solon, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorious throughout all the earth. So why do we give to God's house? That the house of God may be exceedingly magnificent, 
famous and glorious throughout all the earth. You know, um, a number of years ago, you might remember that Russell Crowe and his business partner at the time, Peter Holmes, a court, bought themselves the, Sydney, the South Sydney Rabbitohs Football Club for $3 million. That's $1.5 million each. But why? How does Russell Crowe justify spending $1.5 million on his beloved South Sydney Rabbitohs? Because he wants the Rabbitohs to be magnificent, famous, and glorious. In 2003, Russian billionaire businessman Roman Abramovich purchased the English Premier League football club Chelsea for a price of £80 million. And that's £170 million in Australian. And to this day, Abramovich has spent billions. He has spent billions on the club since arriving in 2003. Why? Why is he doing that? Because he wants Chelsea FC to be magnificent, famous, and glorious throughout all the earth. That's his motivation. Jesus wants his church, his beautiful bride, to be magnificent, famous, and glorious throughout the earth. And as Christians, we have a holy responsibility to ensure that happens. It's interesting that there is such a hoo-ha when the church begins to do uh, financial begins to financially prosper. But you know, it's easy to understand why terrorists have key financiers and organizations on their bankroll. Why? Because they can't fight against their enemy without sufficient financial resources. It's interesting that the US government has treaties with countries around the world that enables them to freeze the assets of terrorist organizations. Why? Why is that? Because the, the U.S. knows that the quickest way to stop terrorist organizations is to cut their funding. And the moment that their funding is cut, they lose their ability to achieve their objectives. It works the same way with the church. Do you know why the devil has fought tooth and nail to keep the church poor? Because the devil knows that if he can keep the church poor, then the church won't have any voice or any influence. And by the way, I should clarify, the church, not necessarily, you know, there are some poor churches, for example, in third world countries that do have an impact without the need of, of money. But money does play a significant part in that. So in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 20, it says that the poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. And that's Proverbs. And then in Proverbs 19, verse 4, it says, wealth brings many friends, but a poor man's friend deserts him. Please don't misunderstand what I am saying here, where it says many friends. It's speaking of influence. The enemy wants the church to be shunned by its neighbors. The enemy wants the friends of the church to desert her. You know, we have a holy responsibility to prosper for the purposes of the kingdom. And that's not necessarily financially. But we have a responsibility to flourish for him and for his kingdom. If a church has nothing, it can do nothing. If the church has little, it can do little. And if the church has something, it can do something. And if the church has much, it can do much. The Bible has made it abundantly clear that it is God's will to be financially provided for. But it's not for us to splurge on ourselves in disregard for others. The primary purpose of blessing is that the church becomes effective and influential in our community. The local church is the hope of the world, and it's God's plan that the church becomes magnificent, famous, and glorious throughout the earth. So that all may know that while the church exists, there is hope for mankind. 
But you say that you've been sowing and faithfully giving and yet you haven't seen any harvest that we've been talking about. Well, open your Bibles to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1 and from verse 4 to 11. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. <clears throat> Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. <clears throat> you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. The Bible says that we need to consider our ways. And by the way, I should clarify that I'm not saying that tithing is for us in the New Testament church. I believe that tithing is basically the um, standard. It is the standard. Um, and I think it's a good standard by which we, by which we give by. So. Why do we need to consider our ways? Because we've had an attitude of looking after our own house and not looking after God's house. It's easy to give during a season of harvest and blessing. But what about the season of hardship? Should we get fearful and hold back on our giving when times get tough? No. I mean, if anything, we should be more generous when the times are difficult. You hear people say, I can't afford to give because times are tough. But the truth is, is that we can't afford not to give when times are tough. You know, I remember there was a time when Tammy and I went through extremely tough period in regard to my business, not doing well. And while we went through that season, one of the greatest temptations that we had was to shut down our generosity in our giving. In other words, we were tempted to eat our seed. This was one of the things that we refused to do because the moment we shut down our giving, we cut off the opportunity to sow more seed for the next harvest. Both Tammy and I both knew that what we went through was only temporary and that there was coming a time when we would walk into a new season of harvest and blessing. What does that psalm say? That they will return from the harvest fields with sheaves, um, with, with sheaves laughing and with great joy. So during that season, we resolved that our priority was to be obedient to what God laid on our heart to give each week, no matter how financially adverse our circumstances were. And here's the thing. If you are going through a financially testing time, don't give in to the temptation to stop giving. Don't be tempted to eat your seed. And we can find encouragement by what Paul said about the church in Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, from verses 1 to 3, he says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. That out of the most severe trial." Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Wow. 
Wow. You know, the Bible does not, the New Testament does not teach tithing as under the law, but it teaches sacrificial giving. It teaches sacrificial giving. It reminds me of the story of these farm animals that got together and they said, you know what? We really need to bless our farmer. We really need to bless him because he's been so good to us. He takes care of us. He feeds us. So we need to bless him, extra bless him, I reckon. And so the, the chicken says, you know, I reckon this is how we'll do it. How about we bless him with, uh, with, with bacon and eggs for breakfast? And I'll provide the eggs. And you, piggy, how about you provide the bacon? And the piggy was almost choked up. He says, what? Chicken. You know, that's easy for you to say. For you, it's just an offering. But for me, it's a sacrifice. For me, it's a sacrifice. That's what New Testament giving is all about. It's sacrificial giving. But here's the thing. We get blessed as a result that God is able to make all grace abound to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to finish up here. But I'm going to finish up with this psalm. Psalm 37 verse 25 says, I was young and now I am old. And yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, oh, my Father in heaven, you are our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And we know that when things get extremely tough and we are so tempted to eat our seed, Lord God, that we that the moment that we begin to plant that seed and begin to sow, we know that there is a harvest, and with that harvest comes great joy. So, Father, give us the ability to trust, to repel the voices coming from the corner of the world. that you have a wonderful week and uh, we'll all gather together online uh, Sunday next week. God bless.